Opening the case for opposition, we have Professor Ray Langton. Professor Langton is the Knightsbridge Professor of Philosophy and a fellow of, at Newnham College. Born and raised in India as the daughter of missionaries, she was educated at Sydney and Princeton and has had an extensive career, extensive international career. She publishes widely in a variety of areas, including moral and political philosophy, metaphysics, the history of philosophy, speech acts theory, and feminist philosophy. Professor Langton, you have the ear of the house. Can we believe in a loving God? Reason says no, and revelation also says no. Reason says we cannot believe in a loving God because of the nature of love and the supposed nature of God. For the nature of love, let's ask St. Paul. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, I don't agree with St. Paul about everything, but I agree with him about that. For the nature of God, we turn to the familiar idea that God is all good, all powerful, and all knowing, if he exists. As theologians have put it, God is omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient. God's love is part of his all goodness, his omnibenevolence. And it takes a more personal character in the idea of God the Father, a powerful idea. God's love is supposed to be so great that John the Evangelist writes in one of his letters that God is love. And he writes in his gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God cannot be all these things, as we know from the old problem of evil. The world made by God contains wonders indeed, but also infinite suffering. The suffering wrought by some human beings through violence, wars, and genocides. And to say that that is to be paid for, um, and that's worth it all, so that we can uh, love God, is not uh, a sufficient reason for the extent of innocent suffering that goes into it. There's also suffering in nature. The floods, famines, viruses, parasites that kill and maim, devour organs, cut off life. A whole system of nature, red in tooth and claw, where the wolf and the deer alike must pay in the coin of pain. Charles Darwin wrote in 1856, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horridly cruel works of nature. For Darwin, the old argument was receiving new proof. A being so powerful and so full of knowledge as a God who could create the universe is to our finite minds omnipotent and omniscient, and it revolts our understanding, he said, to suppose that his benevolence is not unbounded. But what advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time? It's not just about us, it's about the entire living world. Point of information? Yes. I think a lot of your argument kind of presupposes this. I can't understand why God would allow evil, therefore it's logically... Yes, that is a very good point, and one of my colleagues is going to take that one up. Thank you. If God is... <laughs> If God is all-knowing, he would know about this suffering. If God is all-good and all-loving, he would care about it. He would not want it. If God is all-powerful, he could have made the world differently. We cannot believe in a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving, so we cannot believe in a God at all. Or else, if we insist on belief, in a minute, 
We can believe in a being unlimited in power and knowledge, but in that case, we cannot believe in a loving God. Reason says no. What of revelation? But in meantime, I can take one question. Yes, but just one question is that if you were incapable of conceiving, let's say, serious suffering, would you be human? Would you even exist? Are you essentially saying you would rather not exist and instead another being which was incapable of perceiving suffering? Uh, yes. Would I be a human being if I failed to conceive of extreme suffering? Yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> Reason says no. What then of revelation? Does revelation then reveal to us a loving God? Remember, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, is not proud, does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, rejoices in the truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Do we find in the Bible a loving God? For many years of my own early life, the Bible was, as I recall, the only book I possessed. Here are some stories about the God I found there. In the beautiful but disturbing story of Job, God wishes to prove a point, and he invites the devil to do his worst to a righteous man, Job. The devil utterly ruins Job's life, along with the lives of all those close to him. He takes away Job's property, his cattle and sheep, he kills Job's children and servants, and he covers Job with pustulating sores. Job praises God and defends him. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not also receive evil? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That sounds like the abusive partner that was mentioned earlier. Yes? Could there perhaps be a slight difference between the God of the New Testament, the patient, loving, kind God? Yes, and I, I, can, I, am, I am not making it up, but in fact, one of, our, our, one of my colleagues is going to take up that very point. <laughs> When it gets too much, when it gets too much for Job, and Job asks God, why? God's answer is extraordinary. God's answer is basically, who do you think you are, except put in the most wonderful poetry? Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? This God is all power, not all love. Yes. There's so many people to see that suggests that by putting humans through the suffering, um, God can express his love for humans. And I think that in some ways, you've already mentioned from St. Paul about love, can be compatible. So I would invite you to think what you would do if a friend of yours decided that they were going to teach you a lesson by putting you through suffering and see what you would think of that. Should God be kept to lower standards than your friends? I don't think so. So. Any reader of the Bible will recall, no, I'm, I can't, I've got to press on, sorry. Any reader of the Bible will recall the sectarian violence wielded at God's command, all too alive and well. You will recall the triumphal glee over mass slaughter of aliens and strangers, the citizens of Jericho, the seven days, the seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the killing of not seven, but every single one of the inhabitants of that city, man, woman, and child, with one exception for Rahab the harlot, of course. You will recall the horror and the homophobia and the God who rains punitive fire on the Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah. You will recall these words said by God to a father about his son. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. Those words have never lost their power to chill. What next? Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took Isaac his son and went unto the place of which God had told him. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, took the fire in his hand and a knife, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But don't worry, everything's all right. 
Just like for Job, this turns out to be just another test. The angel of the Lord called unto him and said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, for now I know thou fearest God, seeing as thou withheld thy Thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. God is again all power requiring fear or obedience at any price, including any moral price, but God is not here a loving God. Reason gives us no ground for belief in a loving God. Revelation gives us no ground either. But fortunately, the universe does contain some loving beings, a lot of them. And for all our faults, we ourselves are among them. Love is a human creation, a human achievement, and one of our greatest, just as St. Paul said. I'm just concluding. No wonder that some of us have been tempted to dress up love, personify love, deify love, make love bigger than we are. But love has been ours all along without any help from God. If we can't believe in a loving God, my last point, there may still be one more thing. Can we at least wish for a loving God? Perhaps if we can wish for something at odds with reason and revelation alike. But wishing is not believing. So that is why this house does not believe in a loving God.